Okay, so let's talk about God. Um, now, if you look on your sheet, there's actually quite a few um, uh, scripture references. Uh, we're not going to look at all of them uh, in this lesson, but I'd encourage you very much so to go and, and read them. So first off, let's talk about proof of God. Um, there's a lot of a lot of proof of God, but uh, some of the things that I've chosen to include, um, creation's order and complexity, just, I mean, look at what has been made, um, you know, DNA and, and just, man, you could really make entire lessons just about those things themselves. And I honestly feel like I'm kind of shorting God out by, by not really um, talking more about this, but um, there's just, there's just such, such complexity to what God has made. And, you know, everything works on this perfect little schedule. You know, we get time to sleep, time to work, I mean, time for everything. Uh, morality, the fact that there is a right and wrong, the, th the fact that we have a conscience that tells us about right and wrong. Um, yeah, pleasure, the fact that we can enjoy things. Um, if we all just came from nothing and just randomly evolved, then that kind of argues for the point that we really wouldn't have to feel pleasure. Um, the idea of beauty, what does it, how do we get the idea of beauty? How can we appreciate something that, that is, that is, that has beauty? Um, the idea of perfection, um, we know that there is such a thing as perfect, just somewhere in us, and yet we've never seen a perfect person. Um, uh, but, but more important than those things is the testimony of the changed life of a believer. So testimony is a fill in the blank there. And uh, in First Peter, chapter two, verse eleven through twelve, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Oof, try to say that three times fast. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So. Um, everyone has a God-shaped hole. I mentioned this uh, in last uh, lesson that no amount of drugs, money, or partying can fill. No matter what we do, if we don't seek after God, we will not be satisfied. We might get distracted with things in life, new video games, stuff like that, but nothing will ever fill that. So let's look at who God is. First off, he's unchanging. He does not... He, who he is does not change. However, God does feel and act and respond. On your sheet there, I have a few scripture references. One of them is Genesis 6, 5 through 6, where he regrets having made, made people. Now, what does that mean? It means that he was deeply grieved by what humanity decided to do. See, he still feels and he still acts in time. You know, he, he exists outside of time. He doesn't get older, for instance, but he does still act in time. Um, so God does feel, he does act, and he does respond. In 1 Kings 21, there's a story where a, king, where a very evil king repents, and God, uh, well, actually, I have it here on the screen. Um, God cannot act against his character. Um, that's just kind of, he, he can't ever do anything against his character. So is there anything that God cannot do? Yes, he cannot be evil. He cannot sin. God cannot act against his character. Uh, but as far as strength, no, there's nothing God cannot do. Um, the story of King Ahab in 1 Kings, uh, where uh, King Ahab was a very evil king, and yet um, when he repented, God forgave him. Um, so even though God had promised that evil would come, when Ahab repented and said, please forgive me, God decreased what evil would have happened. Um, so although God never changes and sees beginning to the end, he is still personally involved with the world. He is still very personally involved with the world. He didn't just set things going and step back. Knowledge of evil does not mean you are okay with evil. See, he knew that we would sin, but he also knew that many would be saved. And so he's not okay with evil, but he just loves people, and so he's patient with them. It's just talking about what is God like? Um, and that's that's all we're all we're really trying to trying to talk about here. Um, but you know, remember that story about King Ahab about how he 
was evil. And he repented and God answered him. And so God didn't change. And it sounds like maybe God changed his mind. God changed what he was going to do according to what the situation called for. See, before Abraham turned, he was not forgiven. But when Ab Ahab did, when Ahab did repent, then God could forgive him. So God exists outside of time, yet responds within time. He, he's not held to... We, we live by time. We, we are born, we age, and then we die. God exists outside of time. Um, so, uh, he is everywhere present. I moved that sucker up to get it out of the way, and whoops, it got right back into the way. So, he is everywhere pet and present. Um, he... God is just not confined by space. Like, I have a phone. It is confi confined to a limited amount of space. But God is spirit, and he exists outside of the creation, which means he can be everywhere. However, there is an, a flip side to this. God does manifest himself at times. For instance, in Genesis chapter 2, it says that, um, that God went away, and Adam and Eve sinned, and then God came back. Well... The manifestation of God went. God saw the whole thing. He was there. He just didn't manifest himself. So keep that in mind. He's all knowledgeable, yet may not make sense to us. See, the, because the truth is we're not all knowledgeable. And we don't always think and do what's right. And sometimes God does things that he understands that we don't. So just because it doesn't make sense to us doesn't mean that it wasn't the right thing to do. Um... Other gods that have been created act according to human nature. If you look at ancient religions or you know Hinduism or whatever, other gods always act according to how people think that they should, and not even consistent with their own character. So with God, we really see something that's outside of what has ever been made up by people. Um, God is truthful, whereas other gods uh, lie and deceive. Um, and I really haven't been reading any of these passages um, on your sheet there, the first fill in the blank is testimony. The, the second one is unchanging. Um, under under the heading God's character, the first one under the heading God's character is unchanging. The second one is everywhere present. The third is all knowledgeable. And then the third is truthful. Um, I, I really haven't been turning to any of these passages because it just I feel like it would just take up a lot of time. Um, Numbers 23, verse 19 says... Um, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he uh, not make it good? So, uh, God does not lie and deceive. Um, he can change his mind in the sense of responding to a situation, but not in the sense of lying. So I hope that, that kind of makes sense. Um, he is faithful. Uh, all throughout the book of Numbers, the Israelites failed and abandoned God and kept sinning and, and so on and so forth that God didn't give up. That's that's faithfulness. Um, God is good. <coughs> what that means is he is the standard of good. Everything he does is good because it's him. He's acting according to him. And his character doesn't change. Even when he gets angry, his character does not change. He is always him. And he always acts according to what is good and right, what is right. He never does anything that's not good. Um, he is the very standard of good. Just by being him, he is good. So if he chooses to act or not to act, it's good. And if he talks, that's good. See what I mean? So um, he is loving. If you look on your on your sheet, the one after good is loving. Good, uh, good deeds do not earn God's love. He just loves. And he desires that everyone accept him. He, he, he desires for people. Um, Failure does not cause him to stop loving. If you mess up, God still loves. It's part of who he is. God knows what mistakes you will make. And he still loves. He sees ahead of advance. When you are apologizing to God and confessing your sin, he already sees the next time you're going to do it. And he still forgives you. And he still loves you. Wow. Keep that in mind the next time you get in a fight with your spouse. That is some powerful stuff right there. God is patient, but that's not all. He's long-suffering. 
He's merciful. He's full of grace. He's righteous. He's all-powerful. He's wrathful towards sin. He's completely separate from sin and imperfection. He's just. He's not far off, but not part of creation. He's not out there somewhere. He's made himself very close to us. And Jesus, and through through the birth of Jesus, he was God with us. Um, excuse me. But, however, he's not a part of creation. He is separate from it. In the Hindu belief system, there's very much so well i shouldn't i shouldn't specify because it's really a part of a lot of different um religious other religions is the idea that you know there's there's god in everything or you know whatever um so god has revealed all about himself that he wants us to know in his word that's that's very cool that's very cool that we can know about him in his word um there's no new revelation God does not uh, has not given another Bible. This is the Bible. That's it. Um, especially not one that contradicts the Bible. Like for instance, you know, uh, Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism. Oh well, we have these you know special revelations and everything. That would mean that God is in essence not stable. Um, you know I, know, I know the Mormons, for instance, say, well, we got this revelation from angels. Well, Paul said in Galatians that if someone had special revelation, even if it was from an angel, that they should be accursed. So I don't think that that really, you know, has any leverage to it. Don't let people uh, persuade you to the weird stuff by their claims of dreams and visions and seeing things and... Sometimes they just need to stop eating ice cream real late. So this is kind of how God works, okay? This is all time and space, everything that's been created, this line right here, okay? And here's the moment of creation, and here's the moment at the end where God will will just uh, destroy the earth by fire. We live somewhere, you know, somewhere in between start and finish. Uh, but God, God is like this white all around. He exists outside of time and space. This is all the created universe, all history, everything. If you go out to the edges of space, it's still only you know, within the confines of this single line. God is all this other bit. He exists outside of time and space. Um, so that takes us to the, more of the specific of the character of God. Um, God is what's called the Trinity. Now this gets confusing because this word does not appear in the Bible. The, trini the word Trinity is not in the Bible. What it means is three unity. And it, the concept is taught in the Bible, but it's not really um, explained in an easy to understand way. For instance, the Bible says that Jesus is God. And it says that nobody has seen God. But in the Old Testament, it says when people see God. So we know that they saw Jesus in the Old Testament, but not God the Father. Okay. We also know that the Holy Spirit was seen um, in form like the Holy, like a dove, uh, when Jesus was baptized. So we know that he's talking about God the Father. No one has ever seen God the Father. Um, three. Uh, basically, what the Trinity is is three persons in one essence. The fill in the blank there is essence. If you read in Genesis 1.26, it says about how then God said, let us make man in our image. So there is definitely a a multiple aspect. Okay, now, now does that mean that there are three different gods? No. So all three of these, whatever you want to say, are distinct. There is Father, there is Son, and there is Spirit. Okay? Now, the Father sent the Son, and the Son sent the Spirit. The Father did not die on the cross, and you see what I mean? So there's that. Um, there are not three gods but one. Okay, We only get little glimpses of it from the Bible, so it's, it's something where we'll understand when we get to heaven. But in this life, it's not something that God bothered to explain in a way that we could understand. And that's... That's hard, because if you're like me, you want to just perfectly understand the Trinity, but it's not that simple. People have said, okay, it's kind of like an egg. You know, you've got the shell and the white and the yellow. Well, yeah, except that each of those individual parts in the egg have to com compose the entire egg. 
the yolk would have to be the entire egg, the same as the shell would have to be the entire egg, but it's not. It's the shell and the yolk, and, you know, so it's not the same. Um, and each of these three persons have a different role um, that is mentioned in the Bible. For instance, Jesus is our mediator between us and the Father. He's the one who died on the cross. So you have a little bit of a, a little bit of a very clear distinction, and yet there's only one God. So that there is that, and then you get to get to parts where it says about how Jesus has inherited a name. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit has inherited a name, or that the Father has inherited. It says Jesus has inherited a name, and it's only by Jesus that we can get to the Father. But Jesus is Himself God. <laughs> So what we're looking at is we're looking at something completely different than how things work here. And see, that's part of the amazing thing about God is there are things about God that we haven't even begun to be able to comprehend here that when we get to heaven will be completely different than how we think it is here. So anyways, um, with that being said, let's look at a few passages. Matthew 3, 16-17. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice came out of the heavens, said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here we have the three persons of the Trinity, um, all in one place, all revealing themselves in a different way. Jesus as a man, the Holy Spirit as a dove, and God the Father as a voice. Um, Okay, so I already mentioned there are three there are not three gods but one God in Matthew twenty eight, nineteen through twenty, for instance, he talks about um, how uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and, and the Holy Spirit, um, clearly saying that there are three, but still only one God. Um, in Isaiah forty five, now this one I do want to read. Isaiah chapter forty five. I know I've skipped over a lot of the passages, but um, I really, really, really want to encourage you to read them. Uh, Isaiah 45, 5-7. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Now, notice how he says, in Isaiah, there's two things that he emphasizes. There's not been any before me, and there hasn't been any after me. So we know that there's only ever been God, and there's only one God. But there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so, okay, that takes us deeper into the further, deeper into the rabbit hole. Husband and wife have different roles, but both are equally people. Um, so that's kind of how the Trinity works. God sending Jesus does not make Jesus less of God. Only God is worthy of praise. If Jesus is not fully God, he is less. No matter how good or godly he is, he is only worthy if he is fully God. Which is why the Jehovah's Witness interpretation of God, oh yeah, he's God, he's just not God the Father. He, or, you know, they're, they're, they have different, basically Jehovah's Witness believe in different God and multiple gods. There's Jehovah God and then there's, you know, Jesus, which is, you know, a lesser God. But if he's not fully God, then he's not worthy of praise, but yet the Bible tells us to worship him. So that's a little bit confusing and also contradicts what the Bible clearly says. So this is basically how it works, okay? This circle is God, okay? There's Father, Son, and Spirit. But imagine that all of these separations are fully the circle, okay? Now then, Jesus took something of himself that he was not. He became a human when he was not. And although he's still son, he has taken on this new aspect to himself where he made himself a human. And he will forever be um, a human. He will still be fully God, but fully human. So here we have God, okay? His Father, Son, and Spirit. They are not each other, but they are all God. And I hope that these are helping you kind of under understand um, I know the Trinity sounds like, why? This is so difficult to understand. I'm really trying my very hardest to make it um, to make it easier for you to understand. Um, so that takes us to Jesus specifically. 
he he became fully human. Um, I mean, this is absolutely clear uh, throughout the Bible. I mean, <laughs> Luke 2.52, where it says that he submitted to his mother and father, and um, that, uh, you know, he grew in character. He, he, he grew, not character. Um, I'll just read it. Luke 2.52. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Excuse me. Um, but he was also uh, fully God. And Daniel, for instance, it talks about the uh, Ancient of Days talking to the Son of Man. And the Son of Man we know, from, especially from the Gospel of Mark, is Jesus. And so there was, um, you know, this, he existed before, obviously, but there was this um, separation between the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. Um, so here also I want to mention, um, well, let me come back to that. Um, John 5, 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. See, it was only, um, they would have only tried and killed him if he was trying to make himself out to be God, and that's exactly what he was doing. So we know that God was not, uh, hold on, let me, let me not get ahead of myself. Okay, so he was fully human, but also fully God. Well, how could it be fully human if he was fully God? There's just certain limitations that we just our minds are not able to understand, and even if we were, were able to understand it, the English language is not able to convey it anyways. Um, so let's see, did I miss any fill in the blanks? No, I did not. Um, so that takes us to the third thing there, and this is a fill in the blank. Not created. He was not created. John one one says, in the beginning uh, was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was I'm sorry, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, now, this is a bunch of really specific stuff that you don't have to get yourself worried about, but more of the story being the Jehovah's Witness claimed that it should be translated in the word, uh, and the word was a God. First off, this is disproven by other bits of scripture, so we know that that's not true, because then there would have been other gods, or another god created afterwards, or whatever. Um, so... It says very clearly, and the word was God. And so we know that it's not was a God based off of the way that those uh, words function in that sentence. It's it's a long story. Um, I don't want to bore you with Greek. Um, I love ancient languages, but I mean, this isn't a class on the love of ancient languages. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What begotten means is special or unique. It does not mean only created. And the Jehovah's Witness teach that it means only created. That's not true. It's only begotten means special or unique. Um, in Hebrews eleven seventeen, for instance, uh, it says that Abraham's son Isaac, um, I think I said that right, Yes, was his only begotten son. But the truth was, he had sons after Isaac, and he had a son before Isaac named Ishmael. So we know it wasn't his only begotten. What that means, though, is Isaac was his special son, his unique son, the one that inherited uh, the blessing. Um, so what does this look like? It looks a lot like this, okay? Jesus is God, has always existed, okay? Now... When it was time for Jesus to be born, the Holy Spirit miraculously caused a baby to be um, placed in Mary's womb without sex, without sexual intercourse. So God did not have sex with Mary. He caused something to be where there was not. And uh, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Now then when he died, he was resurrected and lives now in heaven at the right hand of the Father. So... There was never a time when the Son was not the Son. So what does it mean that God was born? Um, oops, sorry, pushed the wrong button there. Man, oh man. Sometimes I swear I'm just not really capable of, of, of handling technology very well. Um, what it means is that um, Jesus was became a human. So he was born, he was a Son of God and Son of Man. In other words, 
God caused God the Father caused the Son to be born as a human. Therefore, he was the Son of God. He didn't always exist as the Son of God, but he became the Son of God. Does that kind of make sense? The reason why we refer to him as the Son of God before he was actually born by the Virgin Mary is because it's easier to differentiate him. But how the Old Testament talks about him before he was born of the Virgin Mary, it calls him, sometimes it calls him uh, the angel of the Lord. Um, sometimes it just calls him God. Um, it, it just refers to him in different ways like that. But long story short, Jesus was not created, and there was never a time when he was not who he is. Um, he is subordinate, but not inferior to the Father. There's an authority thing that goes on where he submitted himself to the Father, but he is not less of God than the Father, just as the Holy Spirit submitted himself to Christ. So, becoming what he was not, he remained what he was. In other words, here he is, God, but he became what he was not, fully human, and yet he didn't cease to be God. So Jesus is our example. Um, he died in our place. He's our priest who reconciles us before God. He's our mediator. He stands between us and God. Um, so let me read a few passages. The first is in John chapter 10, uh, verse 18. No one has taken it away from you, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to uh, uh, to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. And then in Romans 8.29, it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his sons, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. See, God was resurrected. Jesus was resurrected first, and we will be resurrected um, in the future. So, I think that clears up Jesus. Now, about the Holy Spirit, especially in our community, there's this idea that the Holy Spirit is not God. It's just the power of God. Let's just uh, look at that. It's not just God's power. Uh, if you look on the sheet, I have listed some verses that clearly talk about God being and the Holy Spirit being a, a person and being God. Um, in Acts chapter uh, 2, no, 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 5, verses 1 through 4. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, to lie to the Holy Spirit, an essence, okay, now hold on, and to keep back some of the price of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain under, uh, under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Therefore, calling and calling the Holy Spirit um, God. So, uh, goosebumps are not necessarily, <clears throat> necessarily the sign of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we have it in our head that if I feel something, that means it's the Holy Spirit. You know, if I feel tinglies or if I just feel something, if music moves me or if a movie moves me, that's the Holy Spirit. Well, no. Goosebumps are not necessarily a sign of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes something just moves us. Um, the Holy Spirit brings us to salvation. He works on us before we're saved to, to kind of try and soften us and draw us to God. Uh, he causes our spirits to be reborn and grow. Um, oops, move this. There we go. Um... He, you know, spiritually speaking, he gives us power to witness um, when we feel nervous or whatever. He, tell, he gives us the words and he, and he helps us to be witness for God. Um, he is the one who gives us power to glorify God. He's the one who comforts us. Um, and he's the one who, who uses us, gives us the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and that kind of stuff. Um, so um, let me check on – okay, so the fill in the blank there, not just God's power. Power is the missing uh, – Fill in the blank there under Holy Spirit. Um, girl gives us power to witness the Lord for that. Okay, so then I have some passages there um, for you to read. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Galatians talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and Acts 2, 1 through 4 talks about the Holy Spirit coming down in power um, on the uh, disciples. Um, okay, so uh, what is the evidence of the, of the Holy Spirit moving? 
If people have a renewed focus on God and his kingdom and living his way, God will, see, God will not contradict his word. Sometimes people say, oh, the Holy Spirit moved, and yet I have this revelation that goes against what God said. Oh, I have this message from God. You know, he said, hey, you need to do this thing, and it's like, that's not what the word says. So the Holy Spirit won't go against what this says. Sorry. Uh, the Holy Spirit won't go against what the Bible says. Um and so when the Holy Spirit is moving, it will cause us to want to seek after God more, to want to get to know him more. Um, if the Holy Spirit is just gives you a tingle on a Sunday and then you leave, maybe it's not really the Holy Spirit. Um, now, I do want to say, I don't know if this is uh, anywhere else in this um, class, I, I, I kind of forgot, but the only sin that is mentioned in the whole Bible as not forgivable is the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So um, what exactly is that? Well, we might look at that in the future, but the idea here being don't make fun of the work of the Holy Spirit and don't make fun of the Holy Spirit. And just remember that. So, uh, so okay, as far as God's name, some people have different ideas about God's name. Uh, his Basically, his name is Yahweh. We don't exactly know how it was pronounced, um, but... Long story short, that's it. And it basically means I am, uh, or or I am that I am. Uh, God's name is his reputation and character. For instance, Jesus' name is Redeemer, because he redeems his people, and his name is Savior. See what I mean? God's name is his reputation, and it is his character. God's name is good, because he's good. Um, he's healer, he's Redeemer, he's Savior, he's good. Um, but then the specific name that God gave was Yahweh. Um, oftentimes in the Old Testament, uh, God was called um, El or El Elohim, which basically just means God. Um, it's just a general term. Um, but the specific name that he gave was Yahweh. Now, some people think, well, what about Jehovah? Jehovah is what happens when Yahweh goes down through Latin and into English. But the Bible was written in Latin. Um, and so assuming that God's name is Latin is just completely historically false. Um, okay, so if there are any questions about this lesson, uh, please uh, please feel free to ask it. I'll answer um, any of that any of that come across. Um, the next lesson we'll be talking about finances, maybe a little more practical um, than the start of this this course. And so the rest of the lessons will be more about practical application. Um, and uh, so just remember to, to study those, those verses that were listed on your sheet.